Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Jubilee Church Online. It is so good to have you with us today. I'm Pastor Dave Freeman. Let us know that you're with us today. We'd love to hear from you. If you have a prayer request, just let us know. You can go to our website, jubileecalgary.com. And on that front page, there's a little prayer tab. We'd love to pray with you. Also, if you're giving today, you can text any amount to 84321. You can also e-transfer Darlene at jubileecalgary.com or you can go to our website, jubileecalgary.com backslash give and you can give there. Thank you again for your generosity. In just a moment, we're gonna have a worship. But before we do, I just wanna remind ladies that there are ladies groups meeting on every second Monday night. If you want those details, you can contact Jocelyn Freeman or Courtney uh, Elmendros, and they'd be happy to let you know all the details. And uh, we're just looking forward to to Easter service coming up as well. So watch for details on that. And uh, yeah, we're just looking forward to seeing more and more of you. If you're at home and you can make it to church, I just encourage you to come on out one Sunday. We'd love to have you with us. I'm just gonna pray. God, we thank you today for this service. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that we are learning about worship and what it means to worship you. We just pray that as we go into the worship part of the service, Lord, that our hearts would be completely surrendered to you. And Lord, I thank you that you would encourage us, that your Holy Spirit would teach us and guide us. And Lord, that we'd be able to have fellowship with you, that we hear your voice. And Lord, that we have with you, Father God, an awesome time just worshiping you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another online service at Jubilee. This this service, I just want to shout out Brad, all the hard work he's been doing all these weeks. He wasn't expecting this. Surprise, Brad. (laughs) We just want to thank you. Probably active in the chat right now, welcoming everyone in. So thank you for all that hard work you're doing. And now let's get started with some worship. Our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts. With your life, we are here for you. Yeah, we are here for you. To you, to you, our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. There's no one like you, Jesus. Your name is holy. Your name is worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Yes, Lord I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is feeling Your name is love
holy hallelujah Jesus thank you God that when there seems to be no way you make a way that's what you do Jesus thank you God thank you that you're there with us you are for us you are not against us God you make us the, the head and not the tail hallelujah Jesus we worship you Lord You are here. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, you're working in this place. I worship you. I worship.
Have you ever been so excited about something that you were just completely consumed by it? It's all you could think of. It was just so intense. You know, like some men right now are thinking about the warm weather and going out golfing. Some of you, you get excited when Netflix comes out with a new movie or a new series that you've been waiting for. There's so many different things that we get excited about and it consumes us. We, it, it, it basically fills our thoughts. It's all we can think about. And then, and then there's some of you, you're, you get so consumed that you become zealous about something. In other words, you know, it, it's like a, a, a social injustice. And so you get consumed with it and then you also say something about it. And you do something about it. You know, it's like also some of you when Netflix cancels your favorite television show and you become very vocal and you go on social media and say how disgusted you are at Netflix for canceling that TV series. You know, or some of you men who, you know, the referee makes a bad call and your team loses the most important game of the year. But, you know, we get consumed by things and, and, and then we, we can get zealous about things. And as we are leading up to, to Easter, I'm reminded of the time when Jesus was consumed by zeal, where Jesus was just completely passionate about something. Nothing else mattered in that moment, and it totally consumed him. And we talked about this earlier in the first session of our series on worship, but I'm going to take it a little bit different direction today. But here's, here's the account of this story. It's found in Matthew chapter 21. It says, when the Jewish Passover was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, the Passover was a time when a lot of people, a lot of Jews came to Jerusalem to celebrate and to remember the time when God used Moses to deliver them uh, from the Egyptians. All right, so there's a lot of people in town. And they're coming for this celebration, for this Passover celebration. Celebration, And it says, in the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers. And he made a whip out of cords and drove them all out from the temple courts. So here's Jesus. He's, he takes some leather or whatever it was, and he, he makes an actual whip and starts driving the sheep, the cattle, and these merchants that are sitting in the temple who are selling these things at a inflated cost and they're using a space that was designated for Gentiles to come and worship. It says that he poured out the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables. You know, to those selling doves, he said, how dare you turn my father's house into a marketplace? And you know, I have this funny picture in my head because the next verse, it says, his disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. So it's, I kind of see the disciples just kind of stand back as, as, as Jesus is, you know, throwing all these tables over and taking his whip and, and pushing every, driving everybody out. And he's just completely consumed with zeal. And, and it's kind of like, um, they're, they're kind of st- stand back, except for maybe Peter, because, you know, Peter was pretty bold. He might've been like, oh yeah, Jesus, this is awesome. You know, uh, you know, Peter's the guy that chopped off the ear in the garden of Gethsemane. And anyways, they're sitting back and say, like, oh yeah, right. This, this is that where the Bible says that the zeal for God's house consumes. So Jesus is really consumed right now, but yeah, Jesus just, you know, some people would say he went ballistic. He just, he just went crazy. But he was radical because because of what he was doing this for, and why was he consumed, and why was he so zealous, and why was he throwing all this these tables over, and why was this all disgusting to him? It's because he said, "My house would be called a house of prayer. My house would be called a house of worship. This is a place for people to come to meet God, not for you to rob them, not for you to use the spaces and the places for things." that are, that are um, taking advantage of people for your religion and for your, your powerless traditions. This is, this is a house of prayer. And so Jesus was consumed by the Holy Spirit with zeal for this thing. You know, when you think of what a house of prayer is and what it was at that time in, for Jesus, the house of prayer was supposed to be a place of relationship. The house of prayer was supposed to be a place of healing and a, and a place of God's presence to connect for God to reveal himself to people and for the priest to represent God's goodness and his, and his love to the people. But they turned it into something else. The house, a house of prayer was supposed to be a place of purification and purity. It was supposed to be a place of, of God's power and a, and a place of purpose. It was designated 
but it had been completely, the, the purpose had been completely lost on people's ambition and, 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 and their money. And, and they had turned it completely into something that wasn't a house of prayer. And you know, as we think of this here, it's, it's interesting because I, I'm, as I, I think of Jesus' zeal and how much he was consumed for, for this building, you know, which, you know, if you think about what was about to happen, Jesus was about to go to the cross. He was, supposed to, he was about to give his life and, and to die and be resurrected again. And then he was going to institute a new way of living in a, in a new temple. And we read about this in 2 Corinthians 6.16. And it says in 2 Corinthians 6.16, it says, We are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. So here we have this new expression of the temple. We have this, this new example of, of what uh, a house of prayer is. And it says that we are the temple. So no longer, was, no, no longer is the temple the building that Jesus went in and, and, and did all that. Now we are through, through receiving Jesus Christ. And believe in him, he says, now I've made you a place of relationship. I've made you a place for healing. I've made you a place for the presence of God. I've made you a place for purification and purity. I've made you a place of power. I've made you a place for purpose. You know, there's a verse that says, 1 Corinthians 16, 19, it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have re, whom you received from God. Therefore, glorify God in your body, that you were bought with a price. And so, this zeal that Jesus had for this building, where he went in and got ripped off because people were not allowing it to be what it was meant for, which was prayer and worship. He even showed more zeal by going to the cross and giving his life that you and I could now become the temple, that you and I could now be the thing. That's, that's how much zeal God has for us. That's how much zeal Christ had for us. That's how he, he proved his zeal. And I think it's absolutely amazing that here we stand, that, that by faith in Jesus Christ, we become a dwelling place for God, that we, we are bought with this price of Jesus' life so that you and I can glorify God in our bodies, that we can become that temple, that we can... That we can become that place of worship, that place of healing, of, of, of presence, of power, of purpose. And so if Jesus, you know, if he had that much zeal for us, which by the way, God's, we read the Old Testament, we look at God's passion for certain things, for, for holiness and righteousness. And we think for some reason under grace that God's passion for, for rightness and, and, and holiness and 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 relationship that his zeal has lessened? No, it's increased. It's increased for us. God has zeal for us, a passion for us. But the thing is, is he hasn't, Jesus hasn't lost his zeal for us. So now knowing that that, that same zeal that Jesus had for that building, you know, in, in, in saying, hey, why have you turned this into a place where you're, you're selling things now he's taking that zeal and he's pouring it out towards us and he has it for us. It, it makes me think that worship is, is about a zeal that is returned back to him, that, that now you and I, having received the Holy Spirit, now having become a place for him to dwell, how much more should that zeal be in us for him? It, it makes me ask the question, what do we carry fervently in our heart? Where or what do the affections of our heart race towards? Because that's what zeal is. What consumes us? What is the primary pursuit of our hearts? What, what's the ambition? What's the, is, it, is it fame? Is it status? Is it uh, riches? Is it love and affirmation from other people? Is it greed? Is it lust? What are those things that, that, we, that we're zealous about? Are we more zealous about swinging the golf club and, and, and buying our next house? Knowing that we have now become a place, a temple for God to dwell and that we are created for the purpose of, of worship and putting him first. Does he get that zeal in our heart? Does he get that same zeal in our worship? Or is he just a slice of the pie? And part of our excitement, do we get more excited at our hockey games and our football games than we do about the fact that he laid his life down for us so that we could have a relationship 
with him. Romans 12, 11 says, do not be slothful in zeal. We can be lazy in our zeal. And worship is saying, I know what I've been created for. And that is to love and to be loved by my creator, to express and to know him in a, in a deeper way than ever before, to know why he gave his life and to understand and experience the fullness of that sacrifice that he made to have that excitement to be consumed about it so that it's what I think about more than anything else. So that what I carry in my heart is Christ so that what I, what I have my affections towards are the things that God loves, that, that my zeal is for his heart, it's for his will, it's for his glory. God, in all that I do and all that I say, remind me that this body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. This body is a place that was prepared for prayer and worship. To experience the glory of God, to know the will of God, to live out the glory of God. You know, worship and worship Jesus calls us into a culture that seeks after him, nothing else. A culture is something that is, that is lived out because of the values, because of the understanding, because of the focus, because of the things that we're consumed by. Are we consumed by worship? Are we consumed for Christ, for his goodness, for his glory? Worship is seeking with the intention to reveal the magnificence of Jesus Christ. Is my everyday a search to see how I can reveal the magnificence of Christ? Because he dwells in me because I am a temple. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. He doesn't live in buildings made by hands. And it's great to come to buildings and worship together. When all of us come together and worship God together corporately in a community, but we remember every day that we wake up, hey, I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. I've got Christ living inside of me. This body, it has within it the spirit that's been made new by Jesus Christ, forgiven and all things are made new. So now can, my, can I live my life? Can, I, can, can the example of my behavior and what I do, can it, can it align with what God has done in my spirit? Remembering that this is a temple of God. This is worship. You're building made for worship. You're created for worship. Shifting that focus back to high praise, knowing that we are kings and priests. We're kings because we have authority over sin. Sin no longer has authority over us. But also because we've been made priests and the priests would go into the presence of God and represent the people. And now we go before God with confidence because of the blood of Jesus. There's nothing that separates us. We can talk to God any corner of the street, wherever we go, wherever we are. Because we've been made for worship. We're a dwelling place for God. Worship is carrying the zeal of Christ for prayer and worship to fill every room of our lives. We get the opportunity to carry the same passion, the same zeal for prayer like Jesus did. Remembering that Jesus has zeal for us because of what we've been created to do, and that is to have fellowship and relationship with him. It would be that place of worship, to pour out worship, to be a place where he comes. If we go back to 2 Corinthians 6, 16, it says this, what agreement can exist between the temple of God and idols? Well, we know the answer to that. There can't be any agreement. A way to look at worship is, what are we agreeing with? What is it that we are agreeing with? Are we agreeing with things that would exalt themselves above the knowledge of God? Are we agreeing with fear and doubt and shame? Are we agreeing with lust? Are we agreeing with brokenness. You know, God comes to, to heal us from those things. We don't have to agree with those things. We can acknowledge them, but we don't have to, to agree with them. We can, we can bring them unto the, the Lordship of Jesus Christ, knowing that we are the temple of the living God. As he said, I will dwell with them and I will walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, it says in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 6, it says, therefore come out and be separate. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord. Interesting that Paul is quoting from the Old Testament and he brings it into a New Testament context. 
And this is where it goes in the next chapter, verse 7, or pardon me, chapter 7, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians. It says, Therefore, beloved, since we have these promises, what promises? The promises that he will dwell with us and walk among us. The promise that he'll be our God, will be his people. The promise that he will receive us. The promise that he'll be a father to us. The promise that we'll be his sons and daughters. This is great news for those of us who feel rejected. For those of you who live your life feeling rejected. This is the promise. This is the promise that we have, the promises that we do have. And it says, therefore, beloved, because we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that defiles body and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What is the fear of God? It's a deep reverence. It is a deep worship. It is a taking God and putting him as priority in our life, realizing that we are the temple that's been created for him to dwell in. And we get to be places of worship. We carry worship in us. He has zeal for the worship and the prayer of our lives. He gave his life for it. And so I close with these thoughts. A, a house of prayer is a, is a house that's cleansed. It's a house that says, God, every corner of me, I, it's a place of repentance Repentance is changing our mind to think like he thinks. God, I, I'm sorry that I thought this way and I did my own thing. I'm coming back to your way of thinking and I want to do things the way that you do them. This is what repentance is. It's a place of surrender. It's a place of commitment. God is bringing us to an understanding that as the temple of the Holy Spirit, our spirit is clean. So our mind, our will, our emotions, we surrender them to God. We we, we, we bring the thoughts that don't acknowledge him. and We bring it to agreement with what he says so that our body, our life, our thoughts, our will honors him because that's part of the temple as well. It's a place of committing to him having all of us, not just part of us. All of us, not just part of us. There's a story of a man named Gideon in the Old Testament in Judges chapter 6. He was intimidated. He was fearful. He didn't know the God that was on his side. But when God came and visited him and changed his mindset, there was a repentance that took place. When there was a surrender to God's will in his life, when there was a final commitment, the first thing that God had Gideon do was go and push down the idols, the idols that declared that there were other gods, to push those things down, and then to build an altar that declared that God was Lord. A place of worship. It was a sign of worship that God is God. And so in our own lives, knowing that we've been called a house of prayer, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, knowing that there, our body is something that we can experience the glory of God through, how do we repent today? How do we surrender those things? How do we commit those things to God that might be in the temple that don't belong? And just like Jesus went into the temple in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and he brought the whip and he flipped over the tables and he drove out all of the unclean. How today can we say, God, there's things in my soul, there's things in my will, in my emotions, things that I've been consumed with and things that I've pursued with zeal that don't belong in a house of prayer, that don't belong in this body, that don't belong mindsets. Maybe it is the belief that you're not good enough. That doesn't belong in the temple. Maybe it's the belief that perhaps you've messed up too much and God can't love you again. That doesn't belong in the temple. And there's so many things that we agree with and there's so many things that we believe. And right now, in this moment, as I finish this sermon today, as I close off this message, I want you to think of all the things that you've aligned with and agreed with and believed and allowed. Things that you've let into your mindset that don't agree with the righteousness of God that he's made you to be. And I want you to give those over to Take the whip and drive those things out. Don't receive those things. The addictions, the lust, the, the pride, 
whatever it might be. Don't take condemnation for those things. Drive it out and give it to God. Surrender it to him right now. Say, God, right now, I, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just, by, by your word and by your grace and by your mercy, would you, would you reach into every part of my house, every part of this building, every part of my, my soul, and would you make it alive again? God, may I be zealous for you like you were for me. May I be zealous for prayer and worship like you were the very thing that caused you to go into the temple and clean it and make it into what it was supposed to be. God, today I thank you. You don't look at us with anger. You don't push us away. You call us to you. And in this moment, God, as we do self-reflection, as we look at maybe where we have not let things that are appropriate, live and abide in our mindset and, and be a part of us as a house of prayer. Lord, we give them to you. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, we receive your forgiveness. We receive your grace. And thank you that today is a new day. And help us to remember every day forward that you have a zeal for us. You have, you're consumed with a zeal for us because you've created us to be a dwelling place of prayer and worship. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God is good. And we are, we are coming to a place of maturity as we surrender our lives to him. And he has access to all the rooms in our heart, all the rooms in our soul, where he has full, where we have full surrender of ourselves to him saying, God, your will be done, not ours. We trust that we begin to see his glory move and we see him reveal himself in ways like never before. We love you. Please do not do life alone. If you're feeling isolated and alone, send us a message, send a prayer request. We'd love to reach out to you. Once again, I want to thank you for your generosity. If you are giving, you can text any amount to 84321. You can e-transfer to darlene at jubileecalvary.com or you can go to jubileecalvary.com backslash give. And you can give there. We hope to see you soon. We love you. Remember, you are a house that was built to carry the glory of God. Let's not waste any more time. Amen.